Hi, Kelly. I'm so excited that you are here on the Studio Class podcast. This is one of our Masterclass episodes. And since you are joining us, I would love to just kick it off with you telling us a few things about yourself. Sure. Well, thank you for ha having me. I'm really glad to be here. So I'm based in Nashville, Tennessee right now. I'm from Massachusetts originally. I am a conductor, but my undergraduate degree was in vocal performance. Um, mm. So I've got the vocal background. Um, yeah. <laughs> then my master's was in instrumental conducting from IU. Um, I worked at the Nashville Symphony for nine years on their conducting staff and have guest conducted orchestras all over, um, was on a tour with the Legend of Zelda doing video game music for a few years, which was super fun. Yeah. Um, so conducting is my main gig. I also am artistic director and conductor of Intersection, which is a new music ensemble here in Nashville now in our ninth year. Congratulations. Um, thanks. And I teach at Middle Tennessee State University as well. I do an intro to music class, which I love doing. Yeah. Um, do a lot of other things. And then I also just recently got a master of public health as well. So I have oh. a little bit of like a public health, arts and health integration into my work recently too. So I'm sure yeah. we're going to get into all that stuff, but all I think that, that's, yeah. a, that's a good summary. <laughs> 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 the beginning <laughs> overview. <laughs> I love that. I, one of the things I love about all of my masterclass guests is just that we wear so many hats mm -hmm. and it's really cool to just talk about all of the ways that we follow our interests in this life to kind of say like, well, I like doing this and I like doing this. And that kind of is what fills out my entire puzzle. You know, it's not just one thing and, and you don't have to just be one thing. So I, I wonder if you have felt that in, in the fact that you've pursued a lot of, a lot of interests, but it definitely is all you. It's all Kelly Corcoran. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that we're all unique wonderful creatures who get, yeah. <laughs> we get to define who we are right and so yes. um yes I'm a conductor um but I you know love a lot of things and I think that what a conductor is can mean many different things for many different people too so we get yeah. to define what that means for ourselves oh I love that yes well I always start a masterclass episode asking what is an intention that you're keeping for yourself right now so this can be anything it can be part of your musical life but it can also be be part of any aspect of your life. So what is an intention that you are keeping for yourself? Yeah. Okay. So the one that is really important for me is kind of being the change that we want to see in the world. Yeah. And I know that's like a huge thing and can come out in many different ways in our work. Um, but certainly like as a performer, as a teacher, um, all the things that I do, like I want to be living the values that I want to see in the field. And so I can be kind of specific. <laughs> um, certainly, like as a conductor, a female conductor, I felt this recently, I was with some of my colleagues that are in the Taki Alsup Conducting Fellowship. Marin Alsup is our mentor and, you know, yeah. bringing us all together. And we were at Ravinia for the Breaking Barriers Festival, which was wonderful, celebrating women conductors. Um, but what was so, what felt almost revolutionary to me was just, we were like, totally just supporting each other and cheering each other on and just you know and i i know that might seem strange but i think that often our career can feel competitive and it can feel judgmental and so i think being the change i want to see in the world in terms of intention is just in everything i do trying to say like well how am i supporting my colleagues how are we all cheering each other on how are we working collaboratively like how are we creating this ecosystem of support for each other yeah and then i think another like few parts of the change I want to see like I think it's really important to make space for experimentation and risk in our work I feel like Ooh, in yeah. other fields this like fail fast you know like you learn through <laughs> failure you learn through trying you learn through experimentation you learn through doing different things and I think you know making space in our industry for that it's part of our culture of classical music is an important thing I think we can all work on as classical artists like what does that look like mm -hmm. um so yeah just collaborating lifelong learning taking risks supporting yeah. everybody you know kind of trying to think like what is the way we want to see the field be and become and what and it, it is for in many different ways that already is doing that but to, you know yeah. depends on your sphere of work and so I think just trying to embody that in every interaction that you have Oh, I love that. Kelly, I'm curious about that with, uh, you mentioned fail fast, you write in so many other aspects, uh, 
in other fields, this idea of failing fast, being able to take risks is available because, you know, maybe there's more capital involved in that area and there's more of a buffer. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what that looks like in our field or just kind of classical music in general, what it looks like in, in music overall to talk about making space for risk and for experimentation. I think there's the personal, and then also you work in a lot of larger ensemble settings. You yeah. know, what does that look like? And how do you, I think this is a multi-layered question because I want to, I'm so curious how you make space for yourself to mm-hmm. experiment and take risks, knowing that risks mean potential failure sometimes, mm-hmm. but, and then also making it like available to the people around you that you work with. Right. So I think you're right. This is such a multi-layered question and depending upon where you work, it's going to manifest in different ways. So I think in, in terms of large professional orchestras, it's very difficult because to do a big full orchestral concert, it's just so expensive and there's so much, you know, investment. But I think looking at, well, what are the places where you can take a little bit of artistic experimentation within the context of an infrastructure or environment that there are known things. So you're not changing every aspect at once. You're not, you know, but so for example, I worked in Lexington Philharmonic as their interim artistic advisor over the pandemic. We did a concert where even just some of the pieces were a little bit shorter in length. And so we had more pieces on the program and we actually had a narrator through the program talking a little bit. It's a little thing. It might not work for every concert, but you know, just, it was a different kind of format and the audience, you know, to get also to take surveys, get feedback, hear from people, like always be collecting that feedback. So, you know, when you take the risk or you experiment like well you know what was the response to that so i think in the bigger stuff where there's more money involved and more kind of investment thinking about well what are the parameters that can't be changed but what are the parameters that can be changed or tweaked um Mm -hmm. and then with intersection my uh, contemporary music ensemble in nashville we do a lot of things you know our typical size is 15 players but we do a lot of things that are smaller so we'll do like a string quartet with a dj in a bar or you know all that stuff and we kind of say yes to a lot of stuff to just try and work with different partners and see what works so i think um when you have more kind of nimble flexibility of just being in different venues being with different collaborators like doing different repertoire those are all opportunities to take those risks and experiment and explore where it's not as expensive (laughs) you know you know you're not necessarily like I also for my own career trajectory I think about how Um, I had a position in Canton, Ohio with the Canton Symphony before I came to Nashville. And it was a wonderful orchestra, extremely talented players. Um, But, you know, it's Canton. So it was like I could experiment and I wasn't going to be like reviewed in the New York Times. Right. So I (laughs) I think that's important, too. Right. To think about, well, what environments can I be in where it's supportive and I can, you know, just try stuff um, and it's not you know, (laughs) going to ripple out necessarily beyond where you are. Um, But I think also remembering that even if it did, that's okay. Then just get up tomorrow and try again. I don't know. (laughs) Very much like I try not to get um, negative about, you know, when things don't work out, you know, I don't think it necessarily means your career's over, you know, you know, so, um, so personally, I think I just try to be open and also maybe interrogate every project and think like, okay, what assumptions am I making here? Mm. Um, What are the levers that can be pulled? You know what I mean? Just really kind of breaking it apart a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that you're able to do that with yourself as well as kind of with colleagues and, and collaborators, that interrogating of the project and just saying, okay, well, what, what can we change? Do we want to change something? You know, is that part of your process going into a project? Yeah, definitely. And I think to your point, even just at the beginning of our discussion about wearing many hats and being able to kind of show all the aspects of who we are, I think that is a risk in certain environments too, right? Like being able to say, um, you know, I don't know, I care about social justice and I want to make sure that's a part of this program or I care about whatever it is, you know, or I, I want to make sure, um, my daughter, I mean, I've done concerts where my daughter has come up to me and started hugging my leg when she was younger in the middle of (laughs) an environment where kids feel like they can come up and they can, you know, be close. And, you know, these are all risks in a sense that are kind of, um, 
just rethinking the ways in which musicians are interacting with our community. And so um, anyways, I'm, I'm kind of talking a little bit in circles, but yeah, no, I, I think like it's there's, great. <laughs> there's not necessarily for me always a distinction between like my personal work and my work in community, because I feel yeah. like it's all, it's all part of the same Absolutely. Artistic uh, exploration. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this episode is going to be me being like, exactly, Kelly, exactly. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, it's no. just that I really love it. And one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on is that I feel so strongly uh, that we share, we align on a lot of things, especially being musicians and, and artists in community. And what you were saying about how you are as a conductor and community and what that means for you is is very inspiring to me and I think I'm wondering if maybe you would talk just a little bit more about that and how you see yourself as being a conductor in community or or the ways that you can be kind of an an artist who's in relationship you know in various ways right um I think in you know this is maybe more logistics but I think sometimes even just being in the room in different conversations with different communities is really important. So, for example, I serve on like the health, health equity workforce, you know, for yeah. Healthy Nashville, or I'm on the Music Makes Us Committee, which is with Metro Public Schools. And so that's yeah. not like me conducting on the podium, yeah. but I think having an artist in the room, having a conductor in the room is one of the ways in which you show up in community and that you spend a lot of time just listening to what are the issues and challenges that are happening in metro schools, happening with the health of our community, so that you then can make an informed response in the art that we make in relation to that community. So I think you have to like show up, you know, mm -hmm. and um, not always show up when you're wanting something, but show up just listening and supporting and being there for people yeah. when they need you. And um, and then I think all of that mixes together in the pot of thinking about, well, what is relevant art and how do we build this together? And um, uh, later on, I know we'll talk a little bit about repertoire, but there's like a piece I'm going to talk about a little bit that um, embodies that. But but yeah, I think it's, you know, you have to be in community every day, not just on the podium. Yeah, you know? yeah. it's, it's great when you're on the podium oh, and you're preach, introducing, Kelly. <laughs> like introducing the pieces like, no, we're going to play blah, blah, blah. But I mean, I think it's, I think it's just, um, you know, like really thinking about what are, what's happening in your community. And I think wearing that public health hat a little bit, it's like, I feel very, very strongly that the arts are so essential to everything that we do as humans, yeah. that I think as artists, it's really important that we're informed about the challenges um, as it relates to, you know, housing or <laughs> food or yeah. all of these basic needs that people have, because I think um, we have to be able to advocate for art in the midst of these conversations with powerful people in our community. Absolutely. Kelly, I'm wondering, I would imagine that a lot of our listeners feel like they want to have that kind of involvement in in their local geographic community, in other in various ways that they experience community. I'm wondering, did you ever feel any reticence or maybe I'm, how do I get involved with this? Like I have a I have a value around this, but how do I find the people that are talking about it? How do I make sure that I can be in that room? Do I have you know, the, where do I have what it takes to also be present there? You know, I think sometimes we hold ourselves back and say, oh, well, my, my opinion, I mean, I'm, I'm a musician. I, you know, went to school for music. Can I go be a part of this like civic board feeling, you know, might feel like intimidating on a certain level. I'm wondering if you've ever experienced that or if you would have any words for our listeners that feel yeah. that they want to get more involved that way but aren't quite sure. Well, I think first of all as musicians, we have this incredibly diverse skill set of understanding the nuanced human experience, you know? Like we I I think as artists and musicians are already in touch with you know, communication and and you know, all of these things. We're also often um you know, skilled and well-versed in managing many different things, right? We're practicing, yeah. we're pre preparing for performance. So I'm saying all that to say, yes, musicians are obviously incredibly valuable people in the room, no matter where they are. And so I don't think anyone should ever feel like they are not a valuable person who can contribute to any environment, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and so then I think it's good to just kind of do almost like a, I don't know if it's asset mapping, but just like looking <laughs> at who, who am I in community with already? Like who are the contacts and relationships that I already have? And, um, and then I think just being really proactive to say like, hey, I care deeply about this or how can I become involved? You know, and to think about, yeah, like what are your personal passions that you care about, you know? Um, and I also think obviously, it's very broad and very big. And I think it's okay to just say like, this is one way in which I want to be involved. Maybe it's music education, yeah. whatever it might be. And um, maybe it's just one school in your neighborhood. What, you know, it doesn't have to be like a big giant scaled thing. Yeah. Um, but I think starting with, you know, just one community um, and by community in this case, I mean like one school, for example, or whatever, something smaller um, and thinking about what are the relationships you already have. And then you know, going in open minded, not necessarily with an agenda, but just really truly wanting to support what's happening there and understand what's happening there, I think is, yeah, anyway, that's. I agree. I think, I think, I love what you're saying about making sure that you're staying open and you're going in with, with, you know, with openness and questioning in a positive way, which is like, well, what, what is going on here? How can I be a part of this? What, what needs are there? Also, what joys are there? What am I joining? Like, what am I a part of by just being around this, you know, and, and not necessarily being like, well, I have to do something and everywhere that I go, besides starting with a sense of, of curiosity and, and partnership in a, in a presence way. And I think I love that, that that's a direction that I think that you bring to that conversation, which is showing up and, and learning and being open. <laughs> well, and I think it's all about trust, right? You have to build trust and build relationships and um, that takes time. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think also don't be discouraged, you know, it just, it takes time to build yeah. trust. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to switch gears ever so slightly into talking a little bit like hard skills, right? And one of the questions that I love to ask is what is a technical skill that you love to teach, right? So this could be anything, but we're kind of talking like hard skills. What's something when it comes to kind of like technique that you impart to students? Yeah. Um, as a conductor, one of the things I love to do from a conducting standpoint is to physically break down the gesture into different parts of my arm that I'm moving. So like I'll have students take a baton and you know just conduct with only their fingers moving, yeah. for example. And then, I mean, this is kind of a basic thing, but I think just kind of recognizing all the various joints in your arm that are moving yeah. and isolating them. So then maybe just the wrist, um, just the elbow, just the shoulder. And you know, you would never conduct where you're only moving your shoulder, right? <laughs> but I think it's a really interesting exercise to think about, wow, like the power and, um, you know, versatility and dimension and in space that I can inhabit just yeah. by utilizing these different um, unique isolated parts of my arm, right? So I think yeah. also then developing an awareness for, wow, I feel really comfortable when I'm using this, my, this part, but man, when I'm just using my fingers, like that doesn't feel flexible for me or comfortable mm -hmm. or, you know, as versatile. So I think it can also be a way to inform where to strengthen your gesture. Yeah. Um, because I think as a conductor, ultimately your job is to, you know, show the music and not have to use words, right? So you want to have this vast vocabulary of gesture and every conductor has, you know, their default gesture that yeah. they <laughs> get into sometimes. And so I think a conscious awareness of, you know, what is my default and how do I break the default? Um, but that's just one fun thing I like to do with my conducting students is have them, you know, just kind of, isolate stuff and then also think about well that's interesting if I only use my wrist you know um what does that look like musically you know does that look legato or or can I only using my wrist do a legato can I you know do all the different types of articulation just with each unique yeah. you know, point of movement um absolutely but I think it's this idea of isolating you know simplifying yeah. down which yeah. is helpful and informative. 
Well, and one of the things that I also like about that, that you were just kind of gently baking into that whole thing is also a little bit of like injury prevention, because if you isolate, yeah. then you're like, you're even more aware of every the parts of your body that are contributing to specific gestures. And so if you are experiencing any sort of fatigue or even into the side of injury, then you're also more aware of what your body is doing so that you might be able to, to interrogate that a little bit more and say like, Oh, okay, maybe this is a dysfunction. I should probably fix that. That's, yeah. I don't have to add a dysfunction as part of my gesture, but right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I know, you know, as a singer too, right? Like the tension or freedom that you feel in your body directly affects your sound as a singer. And so I think as a conductor, it's the same where if you're really tense when you're conducting, and sometimes we're totally unaware of the tension that we hold in various parts. Oh of my our gosh, body. right? You know, it's like I get the massage and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what it's supposed to be. Oh my, God, oh my God, it's supposed to be this relaxed. Anyway, but, you know, I think that um, to the point of tension in your body, right? Like, obviously, if you're tense when you're conducting, you yourself are going to be tired, but it also comes out in the sound of the orchestra too. Yeah. And often it's just an unconscious thing, but the players can feel that tension and they it affects them and their playing as well. So yeah. So it's really important. I think I try to just, you know, be loose. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe that's not the right word, but just, you know, be aware and try to think about where am I holding tension in my gesture too. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm wondering as part of your process, you know, you're, you're conducting all the time, but going into a rehearsal, going into a performance, do you have some tried and true process before you go that is helping you maybe be aware of anything that you might be bringing into it, you know, traffic, like whatever you had to like, you know, walk the dog and it took forever. Well, I don't know, whatever it is for you, yeah. but like that thing where do you have a process that you kind of like allow yourself to be aware of what's going on in your life so that you're able to kind of assess and then take yourself into rehearsal, performance, you know, study, yeah. whatever it is. Well, I will say again, like thinking about, um, as a singer, I remember being an undergrad and sometimes being frustrated because I would be like, man, if I don't get a good night's sleep or I eat too much pizza or whatever, it affects my voice, you know? And I remember feeling like, oh, as a conductor, I'm not gonna have those same problems. Well, of course <laughs> have the same problem as a conductor if you're not well rested or all those things that 100% affects you. And so I think in terms of my routine, I mean, yes, before a service I'll stretch and all that, but I think just in general, I run five days a week. I'm like super diligent about trying to get eight hours of sleep a night. I try to drink a lot of water. Like I try to just maintain healthy practices, even if I'm traveling, like keeping the same schedule of eating. Like I'm mm. a little bit, I don't know if I would say crazy, but I just really care deeply about those things because I do find that when I don't maintain that overall health that it does very much affect my ability to be focused and work and have yeah. you know an effective gesture and all of it so yeah absolutely well and I was especially when you're traveling right as soon as we start to get out of our routines yeah. and we're on the road and unfamiliar yeah. environments and you're eating at weird times or whatever yeah. <laughs> you're like you're like whoo that's especially when I have to like kick back into like wait, what does my body really need right now? Yeah. Am I giving it what it needs? Like, am I ready to do what is asked of me today? <laughs> I will say as a student, I don't recall that being emphasized as an mm, important mm -hmm. thing, you know? So, and maybe, maybe, you know, the world is better today, but I do think that as a student, it's important to begin those healthy practices right away because, oh, yeah. you know, anyway, yeah. No, I think that you're right. Well, and I think a lot of I'll tread lightly here, which is, you know, uh, higher ed in music is there can be environments in which it's like, push yourself to the extremes, like you're going to have to practice all the time. It's stay up, study, like do all of these things. You're supposed to be overworked and tired and underfed and all of this stuff. And, and I think that that's absolutely a, a detriment to, to what we really do need to know, which is, you know, our bodies are our instruments and, and we have to take care of them in a way so that they can, they can react and do the things that we want them to do. And so I feel you. And I, then hopefully my exhortation that we all just kind of do our part to not contribute to those environments. Right. <laughs> like, right. 
Yeah. So Kelly, one of the things that I talk about in a lot of my work is micro actions, right? I love to kind of break things down so that they're a lot more manageable and it doesn't feel so overwhelming. So like write the grant is never a micro action because it's Mm -hmm. full of so many parts. It's all these different things, but you know, complete the expenses in the budget kind of side. That's a micro action, right? You've broken it down. You're like, well, that's really manageable. I can do that. And I'm wondering for you, if you look at your career holistically and you can think about a micro action that's been important to you, mm-hmm. what, what kind of bubbles to the surface? Well, I'm not sure if this is like micro action in the way you just described it, but I, to, what I thought about was um, not giving up on yourself, like following up with people. And I'll tell a short story. Like when I, when I went to Indiana University for my master's degree, in instrumental conducting at first when I auditioned I did not get into the program yeah. and um so I was like okay that's a bummer and I emailed the teacher and said well I would love some feedback do you have any feedback and um he gave some feedback and was like okay so then I wrote him another email and said well I'm you know I was teach- I was conducting at Interlock in that summer I was like well can I come to IU and can I watch Um, you know, your rehearsals of Matter and Butterfly. And he was like, okay. So I came to IU and I watched the rehearsals and I was like asking questions and all this stuff. And he said, well, can you come in my office for a minute? I said, okay. And he said, well, we would love to have you join the program at IU. And I was like, oh my goodness. Oh, okay. That's great. And I, to this day, I don't know, like, was there not an opening? And then there was an opening, but I think the way I tell the story to myself (laughs) is, is that I think that because I in a sense, uh, showed him that I wanted to study there. I wanted to learn. I was proactive. I didn't give up. I, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I said, well, Hey, you told me I can't be in this program, but I'm going to come anyway and watch what you're doing. And, yeah. you know, like that, that opened that door for me. And so there's been a lot of moments like that in my career where, you know, I started intersection, like I've kind of made opportunities, um, yeah. when there wasn't an opportunity. And so I don't, I don't know if that's a micro action, but I think if you break break down into the micro piece is to say, you know, when something appears like a door closing, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, okay, well, where do you pivot? You know, um, may, maybe it's um, a follow-up email, you know, yeah. an email micro action, right? You just send yes. those yeah. email. Um, but those little things can be really impactful in your career. And it's not that I'm saying don't take no for an answer because sometimes yeah, it is a no, that's not the right place and you move somewhere else and that's okay. But sometimes um, if you really know, like this is really important and you really want to be in this place and this is really, you know what I mean? Like keep, yeah. keep trying, keep yeah. investing that energy there, in my opinion, you know? Absolutely. Um, well, and Kelly... I don't think that one of the things that I really liked about what you said is that I don't think that you went into that after, you know, after hearing like the, you know, you weren't accepted into this program right now. Well, not that anyway, you weren't accepted into this program. You didn't go, well, I'm going to show them and like, and then angle to be like, well, if I just do all of these things, Mm -hmm. then they'll accept me. You said, well, no, I want to see if I can learn from this person. So I'm going to just ask if there are situations in which I can do that. Maybe it wasn't this one by being in this program, but I'm close by. Maybe, maybe I can come to these rehearsals and, and they seem open enough to answering my questions. So that, I love that. That's a beautiful story about, about staying true to like, well, what, what's next asking, you know, how can I still move towards my goal? And I think that's absolutely micro actions. Yeah. Uh, one of my top micro actions, cause I like, I have a way that I like catalog all of these things, my little to-do lists of stuff. I, on, I honestly can tell you that like number three out of all of the micro actions in my life is follow-up. Yeah. <laughs> like it's yeah. the one that shows up out of everything. I think, it, mm-hmm. I think it goes practice in my list of like things. It was like practice, write a thank you card, and then follow up. Those are the, like the top three in my life. And then everything else after that was like, <laughs> follows. Yeah. and so I, I think that following up, as you mentioned, is, is so powerful. And we can sometimes, I wonder if you felt after you, you were not accepted into the program that it stings, it hurts. Oh, but yeah. then you said, well, let me follow up in this way. You know, it didn't stop you 
overall. And I think that's, that's also a, a skill. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that after you don't get something that you want Mm -hmm. in the version that you thought you wanted it at the, at that moment that you can, that you can talk a little bit more about what that feels like for you to still keep pursuing the overall goal. Like what, let me keep moving on this path. You know, I know that's kind of vague, but I'm just hoping to talk a little bit about it. I think even in what you said about how, you know, um, the initial expectation and hope was to get into this program. And then when that wasn't possible in that initial iteration, it was just like, okay, well, what other ways can I engage? So I think that mind shift of really changing, you know, being open to imagining other iterations. I mean, it's almost like the risk experimentation thing, right? Because you try one thing, it doesn't work the way you planned. Okay, well, what can I try next? What can I try next? Yeah. You know, is I think part of this, um, I don't know, resilience of navigating that because it's yeah. like, okay, hey, that, you know, and I also think managing expectations too, right? Because it's important. I think, you know, the whole, all the books of like the secret, right? You have to imagine <laughs> the thing you want for it to come through. And I think there's some value, of course, in having an image of what you want. But I also think that uh, it's a both and, right? Like you imagine what you want, but then you're always, you know, not too locked because sometimes things don't turn out the way that we perfectly envision them and that's the future and that's not now and yeah, you know yeah. let's just pivot to what's next and I think even again on the micro scale like with intersection this new music ensemble I run yeah. sorry the, the sun is coming in my window so the- no, it looks <laughs> great you look um, but, um you know, funding, of course, for professional ensembles is always, you know, yeah. a challenge. And so oftentimes you have a vision of a program of the way you want it to be. We're going to have this kind of lighting and this kind of thing and that and yeah. the funding may or may not um, always align with what your vision is. And so it's a constant push pull of, well, here's what we can do with what we have. Yes, it is possible with what we have. And so I think it is that mind shift thing of thinking about, yeah, what's what's possible what what do we have what can we do with what we have you know Um, absolutely yeah (laughs) Yeah, exactly I mean everybody knows especially on the new music side of things it's like what can we do with what we have is just is Mm -hmm. is the foundation (laughs) (laughs) what can we make happen with this we have two sticks of gum and a paper clip let's MacGyver this thing (laughs) you can do a lot and I think that is I think that that's what is um and I think, you know, sometimes when you have those limitations, that's when you're the most creative, actually. Yeah, yeah so it right? on this feeling of renewed creativity, like, okay, that didn't go the way I planned. But now, I mean, it, it almost fuels you and fires you up when you're having oh, totally. to work within that, those limitations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this is a segue, but I'm, I'm wondering if this also has to do with repertoire, because we, we do love to talk about repertoire here. And I always want to know, you know, what's on your repertoire wish list, or like, you know, what's a, what's a piece that has really filled you up, you know, kind of just tell me about your repertoire dreams. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, this is a hard question, right? Because (laughs) the repertoire is so vast and there's so many, there's so many. So in terms of a, a piece that I've done that, that was really impactful and really meaningful. Um, it, this was a work that we did with Intersection. We did Joelle Thompson's Seven Last Words of the Unarmed for, yes. for Real Chorus, and we did wow. the string ensemble version. And we did this years and years ago. Um, maybe it was the piece was only a year or two old at the time that we did it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, um, you know, the last words of men, a- African American men who had been killed by figures of authority. Mm-hmm. And so this particular concert that we did, we did it at Fisk University and Joelle came to town and was there for the performance. Um, but the community chorus we gathered of men to sing the work included students from Fisk, from Tennessee State University. Um, there's a celebration chorus that sings every year with the symphony on their Martin Luther King Jr. program. Um, We had some high school students. I mean, it was like a very vast collection of community members that were in the chorus. Um, And we rehearsed at various locations. And we also rehearsed at the um, Nashville Public Library. They have a civil rights room and collection. And they did some training, you know, with the men who were in the chorus. And um, but so this work came to my mind in terms of repertoire because um, First of all, it's an amazing piece of music. I mean, the musical composition itself is um, just 
wonderful in terms of I think the vocal writing and the the, the variability of the movements and the tempi and how the setting of the text and if anyone's not familiar with this piece I would encourage them to listen to it because it's a beautiful be beautiful yeah. piece but obviously um a very emotional piece to listen to as well um and so anyway that piece came to my mind in answering this question because I think it it hit a lot of the things that I care deeply about I think having um, the composer there and doing contemporary work is so important and I think naturally when we do contemporary work we are navigating the complex issues of our time and I think it's really important that we dive into those conversations <laughs> and make yeah. space for them and you know in the course of doing this work and preparing it and again with the community chorus the preparation happened over weeks and weeks and weeks so we were able to live with the piece for quite some time um you know, there were often other students that we worked with at other universities who were not musicians who felt, and this was the kind of intention of the work, that the work really did humanize these men and their stories. And so, yeah. again, to this power of music to just really help us understand <laughs> our time mm -hmm. right, in a way that nothing else can. Um, yeah. So that's that's one piece. And then, you know, a giant pivot to the wish list, which is yeah. a total completely different contrast and <laughs> I kind of feel I know I'm gonna say it with great pride actually Beethoven 9 it's so yes. fun <laughs> and, and I, you know and I kind of felt like oh but this is a piece that honestly as a singer I sang for many years in the Tanglewood yeah. Festival Chorus and yeah. so every year at the end of Tanglewood we would do Beethoven 9 with all the different conductors and I've conducted the last movement and I've done you know parts of the other movements but I've never had a chance to do a straight up top to bottom Beethoven nine. Oh my gosh. And I'm just like, I gotta do a Beethoven nine. So yes. that, but that also, again, to the point of just why music is so awesome with every piece that we do, like that's the piece that, um, you know, I have had the experience of coming to it many, many, many times as a singer, as a teacher, and as a conductor, and, you know, obviously always finding new things in the piece each time. And I think that's the beauty of all repertoire, right? That like, yeah. you know, and so, yep. you know, some old, some new, right? We we've lived yeah. with longer than others, um, but yeah. I mean, I could keep going about repertoire, but I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll do like a bonus episode where we just talk uh, repertoire the whole time. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I love that. I I remember and in wherever we are in the pandemic, as things have started to open a little bit more, um, I remember telling my significant other, I was like you know, I just strangely, like, I weirdly have this desire to do a Beethoven 9. <laughs> I was like, I just, I think that it's that joy of humanity, like all of us coming together. I was like, there was a, there is a deep desire to experience that musically with other people right now. And, and it's been so long since I've been able to like, sing with that many people that that I felt you know I think I it just was on my mind so I when you said that and I just like lit up and I was like yes I'm, <laughs> I'm like I'm not alone in this. <laughs> mm -hmm. so I love I love that we'll talk repertoire sometime all day and it, it will be great but I'm you know as we're starting to kind of wrap things up here I know that you know I believe deeply in the power of curiosity I just think that it's great to ask questions and always be thinking and being open and learning. So I'm curious about what you're curious about these days. What's kind of on your mind or what's what are you opening yourself up to? Well, I've been thinking a lot these days about, um, you know, the life of a freelance artist and and a lot of the themes we've already touched on in this conversation about the myriad uh, or multiplicity of of dimensions of that kind of life and what that looks like. And um, in, I'm sure you know, and many of the listeners know, right? Like being a freelance artist is really great. You can control, you know, where you're doing things and there's great versatility and diversity, but having a sustainable career in terms of just income and all that stuff, you know, can be challenging. And I think it's important that we as a field continue to talk about this stuff and be really honest and open about it. Um, so, so that is like, you know, but to the point of that, right, like I'm a conductor, I run uh, intersection, I teach, but some of the other things I'm excited about these days, I actually um, got a life coaching certification because I thought, that that, I thought that that 
would be really fun, you know, to yeah. work with artists and this idea of visioning and dreaming and helping people with actionable steps that they are doing for their own yeah. lives. Um, so that's something I'm really excited about. And then, of course, you're in the podcast universe, and I know everybody is <laughs> doing podcasts. Um, yeah. I what I care deeply about is. Um, having like real true tangible solutions to mm. how do we reimagine or maybe it's not reimagined but just how do we you know make classical music in this field continue to be relevant and welcoming yeah. and accessible to everybody in the future and so what are the parts of the systems and structures that um we want to keep <laughs> and what mm -hmm. are the parts that we can interrogate and we can kind of think about how do we reframe all this? So I would love to do a podcast that is really doing case studies and talking to different people in the field about what they're doing and what that looks like and just yes. tools. So they're they're percolate, per, percolating. Am I saying that word? <laughs> they're bubbling in my head right now? But those are some things I'm excited about and just want to continue to be a force for you know. Right. Yeah. No, I cannot wait to listen to that podcast. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> I will be right there. Hit that subscribe button. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Well, Kelly, thank you so, so much. Uh, before I let you go, I want you to let everybody know where you, you can be found on the interwebs. So where do you want people to kind of find you, find out more about what you're doing, all of that good stuff? Yeah, so my website is kellycorcoran.net. .net. .com. <laughs> .net. Yeah, um, Kelly, would you spell your last name for anybody who's listening? Sure. So it is C-O-R-C-O-R-A-N. So yes. Kelly. Kelly yeah. .net. .net. <laughs> and on Twitter, I'm Kelly Conductor. Okay. Um, and I th Twitter's my main my main jam in terms of social yeah. media so so I, I would recommend that's the place for me <laughs> awesome awesome um, yeah hey Megan can I add one final quick thing of course, if we have time? Yeah. you know I was I kind of um there's some my daughter is 12 and at her yeah. school um one of the you know administrators at her school was talking about respecting everyone in the community and all yeah. that and, and she said you know there's there are four things I like to say to people when they contribute things to a conversation and she said it's important to think to yourself and I wrote this down so I didn't forget she said is it true mm -hmm. is it necessary is it helpful and is it kind? Yeah. And I just loved that. And I mean, maybe yeah. all, maybe everybody's heard that before, but I just thought like, man, that also is a guiding star yeah. for our work as artists. And like, even when you're on the podium, you know, before you start talking, is it true? <laughs> is it necessary? Is it helpful? Is it kind? Um, so anyway. Just a, what final, a great place to end. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Kelly, because this is this has been such a beautiful conversation. And I deeply appreciate appreciate you, your work, how you are in our community. And thank you so much for taking the time to share that with with me and with the listeners. And I hope that we'll get to keep this conversation going. Thank you so much. It's been fun to be here. Thank you.